Hello, everybody. Welcome back from the from the first break. Um, I, uh, you know, can you, does the volume need to be? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm seeing nods. We're, we are um, adjusting on the fly, so thanks for, for everyone's patience, but we'll do our best to make sure everyone is, is heard loud and clear. So I, I, for one, am feeling incredibly inspired by David and Peter's talks about their father and, and you know, feeling really centered and galvanized by the influence of, of Lester. And it's sort of with that, that I'm really excited to introduce our, our first panel, um, looking at where have we been? Um, and in this panel, activists and researchers discuss where drug, drug policy has been and the journey to a more or less cultural acceptance. Um, Dan Adams will be our moderator, who I will introduce in a second. Um, and the panelists will be James Bacalar, uh, Melanie Dreyer, Ethan Nadelman, and Keith Strop. So Dan Adams has been a journalist with the Boston Globe for more than a decade. In 2017, he became the Globe's first ever dedicated cannabis reporter. The author of the newsletter, This Week in Weed, the irreverent and definitive insider's diary of legalization in Massachusetts. He has also reported extensively on marijuana business news, including as part of the Globe Spotlight team, and covered breaking news, municipal politics, business, and the alcohol industry. He has moderated numerous panels, served as a speaker and MC at national conferences, and regularly appears on public radio and network television. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't be more excited to uh, be a part of this panel. Uh, on stage to my left here, we have tr uh, four true legends of uh, drug policy, and I'm really uh, not throwing that word around uh, uh, lightly. Uh, we could probably have an hour-long conversation with uh, any of these folks and, uh, and uh, not have enough time to get to uh, everything they've been involved in and all the work they've done. Um, so uh, before I introduce everyone, uh, I just want to thank UMass uh, for, for hosting this event. Uh, I think, as the Grinspoon brothers alluded to, um, they have showed some real uh, intellectual and academic fearlessness and, and courage in um, embracing uh, this drug policy archive and in embracing Lester's work and highlighting it uh, in a way that even the institution Lester spent his entire life at uh, wasn't uh, immediately capable of doing. Um, so I'm very grateful to UMass and uh, for inviting me. Um, the other thing I want to acknowledge Sorry about that, folks. Uh, one other thing I wanted to acknowledge is, uh, you know, this, so this panel is talking about where we've been uh, in the drug war. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, for, for all the expertise and excellence on this panel, this panel doesn't look like where we've been, right? Uh, the <laughs> victims of the drug war uh, were disproportionately black and brown Americans. Um, and I just, that's something I want to keep in mind um, as we have this conversation. That it was those communities that really bore the brunt. Uh, of these of these laws, and so as we talk about the past, um, you know, this is not a complete representation of it. Um, so, with that said, I'd like to introduce our uh, wonderful panel here. Uh, so, immediately to my left, we have Dr. Melanie Dreher. Uh, she is a nurse, nurse and anthropologist uh, who has spent five decades uh, bringing fields together in her research uh, on cannabis use in Jamaica. She has served as the dean of several nursing schools uh, and has also taught in the faculty of programs ranging from public health to anthropology. Her research has been funded by uh, March of Dimes, the NIH, and the State Department. Uh, we also have James Bacalar, uh, known to many of you here, I'm sure, uh, is a longtime author uh, who, along with uh, Lester, wrote some of the most influential books uh, of the 20th century on the drug war, books that continue to uh, shape policy and minds today. Uh, he also co-founded the Harvard Mental Health Letter. Uh, we also have uh, Keith Stroop. Uh, again, probably known to many of you if you're interested in drug policy. Uh, he's a Washington, D.C. Uh, public interest attorney. He founded Normal in 1970 uh, and returned to the group in the 90s and uh, I believe is still serving as its legal counsel. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have uh, Ethan Nailman. Uh, is one of the uh, country's most prominent drug reform advocates. Uh, he founded and directed the uh, Lynn Smith Center and uh, the Drug Policy Alliance and has advised numerous officials and philanthropists on drug policy. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to uh, kick off our conversation. And I want to begin with uh, James, because uh, you know, James, you were um, one of Lester's uh, earliest and, and most frequent and most prolific collaborators. 
tell us a little bit about uh, when you first encountered Lester, when you first started uh, working with him. I'm curious what your first impressions of him were, and also if you could maybe just uh, paint that landscape a little bit, because I think now, right, we take for granted people talking about legalizing cannabis and other drugs. That's sort of the normal part of the conversation. Back then, a uh, much more radical idea. So I just wondered if you could maybe paint that landscape of uh, what you were sort of up against, what those other narratives were uh, when you began this work. Well, when I first uh, met Lesser in 1973, he was looking for someone to help him work, uh, help him uh, with a book he was writing on uh, amphetamines. Uh, that's when I started working with him. And uh, at the time, uh, uh, I, I hadn't thought much about drugs or drug control. It wasn't a big concern of mine. It became much more, more much greater interest to me as time went on, but I don't know was working with him. Uh, but I, I, I certainly had a, the idea, as many people did, and by the early 70s, my age, and by the early 70s, I was in my late 20s, early 30s, that uh, the, the drug laws, especially with respect to marijuana, were ridiculous and had to be changed. Uh, uh, so uh, when I met Lester, I was particularly I was particularly impressed by him, and I think this a lot of this has been covered by his sons. Uh, he was very uh, uh, he had a gift for helping people, as they said. He was a very uh, uh, people came to him for support in all kinds of situations, and uh, when I went to work with him, I realized that. And uh, the, the situation of drug control, uh, the questions of drug control was still very, uh, you know, in a, uh, I guess, uh, the, the state was still, it was just, just budding, just beginning to bud. And he was, uh, to be fair, his book on, his book, Marijuana Reconsidered, had already been published by Harvard University Press. So just to be fair to Harvard, although he, Although we sometimes have sure. something to say about Harvard. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Harvard. But, but uh, so that's when we, that's, at that time, it was really something that was just very a very small issue for me. It was a fringe. And, it was a fringe and, and for topic. Me, yeah, it was, it was a fresh topic. Um, was there anything about Lester, um, not just his work, but uh, his sort of style in approaching it that, that affected you or struck you, uh, as you as you first encountered him uh, at that time? His personal style was what struck me most. And, and, his, and his sons have covered that very well, I think, in their talk. Uh, he had this uh, feeling of enthusiasm and confidence. Uh, he was always very optimistic about uh, the possibilities of control, much more optimistic than I was about the possibilities of change in drug control. And I'm, I'm glad that he was able to see this come to fruition at the end of his life with respect to marijuana and psychedelic, to some extent, psychedelic drugs. Uh, uh, he, um, and, uh, we had a conference uh, last year, and someone described him as having brought to, uh, respectability, credibility, and validation to questions of drug law reform. Uh, uh, and he was also described as a profile in courage. He once told me that he had been advised that to get ahead at Harvard, you had to keep your head down, but he was constitutionally incapable of doing that. So, he, he, uh, uh, so it was that personal influence, was, influence on me was important. Uh, I, I'm sure everyone on the uh, stage can, can probably relate to that feeling of, uh, of, of uh, sticking out and, and um, you know, not wanting to be silent about these uh, issues that are so important. And uh, I'm, I'm a cynic by my nature, but I very much appreciate people like Lester who have that uh, sort of uh, unalloyed, uh, uh, vi you know, pure vision of the future that they're, that they're driving towards. And we need people like that, too, because if we were all cynics, we wouldn't want to live in that world. Um, <laughs> I just want to open it up to, uh, to, uh, to other folks here, and um, we can sort of take turns and, and jump in here. I'm, I would like you to just tell our audience a little bit about how you first uh, got involved in drug policy. I know... You know, Lester's sons talked about uh, how one of the things that motivated him was you know, going into the scientific record, right, and, and just being sort of dismayed, I think, by the lack of evidence. He didn't necessarily expect um, to find that, but, he, you know, he found very little evidence of the harms that he went um, looking for. And I think that his frustration, it seems to me, with that sort of, like, intellectual dishonesty more than anything ideological was one of the big things that drove him. That was my impression. So I wonder if you could tell our audience a little bit about what drives you and, and how and when you first got into this work. Keith, you are? Uh, well, I first met Lester at the uh, first hearing of the National Commission on, on Marijuana and Drug Abuse in 1971. Uh, the commission was set up 
Uh, there were 13 members, nine of them were picked by President Nixon, four were picked by Congress from among its own members. And so no one expected very much from that commission. We assumed they were going to rubber stamp the damn thing and move on. And the first day of the hearings, that's the way it felt. All morning, they had four and five and six witnesses that were reefer maniacs. They were doctors who were telling you that if you smoked a joint, you were going to be on heroin. I mean, it was really crude, basic stuff. But in the afternoon of that first day, there were one or two, I, I think maybe Joel Ford testified, who had a book out, the Marijuana, the New Prohibition or something. Um, Ramsey Clark had had a book out called Crime in America, where he called for legal, legalizing marijuana, and he'd uh, only recently stepped aside as attorney general. So that was a book that we had all read. But the book that really blew us all away was Marijuana Reconsidered. I mean, it was by far uh, the intellectual pace setter for the entire movement. And it was obvious, once any of us read that book, we sort of knew Lester was going to be the person, our point person from that point on. And fairly quickly, um, I invited him to join the normal advisory board at first. He was such an academician. I, I was embarrassed to ask him to join our real board. I figured, what would he want to do with a, a, a drug lobby? You know, I wasn't sure he'd even want to be associated. Well, as it turns out, um, not only did he serve on the advisory board for a number of years, but then he became our board chair for, I think, a couple of decades. And as uh, one of the boys pointed out, there was a period in Normal's history where we went through with some internecine fighting where the board was irreverably sp split. There was no way they were going to work together again. They'd had a board meeting where one of the members stood up and he was so dissatisfied he threw the table upside down that they were <laughs> sitting around. So they all went home. They finally agreed that only Lester Grinspoon uh, had the, the weight to bring the group back together. And so they gave him the authority to pick and choose who among the, the current board he wanted to retain and who he wanted to bring in new. I think that was in 94. And I had actually been away from normal for about a dozen years by that point. I'd gotten involved in the Peter Bourne affair, which I'd rather skip over if I could. <laughs> but, um, so I had stepped aside and was doing some other public interest work. I was running the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and doing some other work. And Lester called one day and said, Keith, I'm putting this, reconstituting the normal board. I'd love to have you come back. <coughs> Um, I wasn't even sure that I would be comfortable coming back on. It had been a number of years that I'd been doing other kinds of work. But I said, sure, I, and let's see how it feels. And within a year, um, Richard Cowan had stepped aside as the executive director, and they asked me to step in. And so I ended up serving another 10 years as executive director. Uh, in 2005, Alan St. Pierre took over and invited me to stay on as legal counsel, and I've been in that capacity ever since. But I can tell you without question, in the 50 years, essentially, that I've worked on this issue, there is no one on the planet that had as much impact and played such an important role as Lester Grinspoon, uh, both as a personal motivator for those of us who worked on the issue, but also he was, I like to say, the intellectual godfather of the entire movement. And t still today, I think Marijuana Reconsidered is the finest book ever written advocating for the legalization of marijuana. Thanks. Dr. Dreyer, you want to tell us a little bit about how you got into this work? Sure. Um, I have a little uh, preface before my meeting with, uh, my first meeting with Lester. By the way, I, I am the recipient, one of the recipients of the Lester Grinspoon Award, I think from Normal. Yes. And, um, which has been one of the greatest honors of my life because, yes, I, uh, I met, Lester, sort of early in this 53-year journey with marijuana that I've been on. <clears throat> but I uh, started my uh, that journey in Jamaica on a mountaintop uh, in 1969, mountaintop village, uh, the same summer that 500,000 of my best friends were at Woodstock, which is where I really wanted to be. And um, but it's not a bad second choice. <laughs> And uh, I, I went down there, a la Ma Margaret Mead, I was a graduate student at Columbia then, to do a cross-cultural study of cannabis. 
And uh, so I quickly identified in the village all the people who were using cannabis. To me, the use of cannabis, the use of marijuana was smoking marijuana. So I got all the farmers and tradesmen and became their best friend for that summer and learned a lot. And uh, one evening, I was sitting in the yard of one of these uh, uh, men and he was holding a small child, maybe three and a half, four years old, a daughter. And he was smoking a big, what they call in Jamaica, spliff. And uh, the smoke was coming out of his nostrils and right into her nostrils. And the nurse in me said, uh, gee, is it wise <laughs> to smoke with uh, a child in your lap? He said, I'm not smoking. My daughter is having an asthma attack. I'm breathing cannabis into her nostrils, ganja into her nostrils. And I, it was a watershed moment for me because I sat there and watched her asthma uh, symptoms disappear. And she regained her breath. And I thought, I am really missing what's going on in this country that had 200 years of experience. And quickly started working with the women who were preparing medicines and teas for children and, and, uh, and, and their families in general. And I, when I went back to the States to write this up, and it actually became my dissertation, um, I was uh, invited. Well, what, one thing I discovered is that the therapeutic use of cannabis and the health rendering use of cannabis was so widespread. It was good for upper respiratory, GI, new babies, topical. I mean, you, there was not a thing that you had wrong with you that couldn't be cured by cannabis in Jamaica. But nobody, and nobody would believe me. This was before the endocannabinoids had, endocannabinoid um, research had been done. And Lester, when I met him about nine years later when we were working on a project together, uh, was the only one who believed me. <laughs> and I thought, oh, finally, somebody has the intellect and the curiosity and the interest and gave me enormous support. We were working on uh, a legal uh, case together, the Ethiopian Zion Coptic Church in Jamaica that had taken over Star Island. And um, Ramsey Clark, the former attorney general for Johnson, uh, was head of the legal team. And I said, well, I can't be a consultant to this unless you send me to Jamaica. And so they flew me down there because I wanted to see the source of the church. And Lester flew with me. I didn't think he'd have any interest in doing that. He was right there and interacting with all these amazing people in the uh, Zion Coptic Church. And he became sort of my, not sort of, he became my mentor, my cannabis mentor. He had the experience, the wisdom, gave me the courage, the advice, and understood that this was more than just a treatment or, or a psychedelic experience or anything else. He understood that this is what made people's lives better. They made lives better in Jamaica, and they could make lives better here. So. Uh, throughout all my career, every once in a while I get a phone call from uh, Lester, and when I stopped being dean, I was dean of nursing. If I didn't become dean, I never would have gotten tenure because they wouldn't have approved my research. So um, I, I was uh, dean here, and then I went to be dean at University of Iowa, and Lester would call and say, why are you going to Idaho? I said, Lester, I'm not in Idaho, I'm in Iowa. <laughs> he said, well, one of those I states. I are not back here in Massachusetts, New York, where you belong. But he had been a constant mentor and guide for me throughout my career, and which I will never forget. And I even, even to the point where I'd say, uh, how much should I charge this lawyer for doing this expert testimony? And he'd say, well, just find out what I'm making and ask for the same thing. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Idea. <laughs> so he was a friend, he was a mentor, but he was the, the wisdom that he imparted and the changes he had in my, I mean, the advice he had for my career have just been wonderful. I miss him a lot. <laughs> that's a very typical uh, Lester story where, right, it's not, he's not just uh, a curious academic, he also always brought that heart to it too, and the interpersonal touch and that um, 
just abiding sense of humanity and concern for, for mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's um, something maybe we too rarely see in, in academia. I agree. Ethan, yeah, yeah. How you got into I, mean, I guess I'm the sort of the newbie on this panel here in terms of because I only met Lester 35 years ago. Um, uh, I'm going to have to ask you to leave the stage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. um, but for me, you know, it goes back uh, in 1980s. I had started a, a PhD program at Harvard, and my only connection to the drug issue was that one of my major aspirations was to get as many of my fellow graduate students in the Harvard Department of Government high on marijuana. <laughs> and I had some unusual success there, but I landed, up doing, yeah, yeah, I, I, I landed up doing my dissertation on the internationalization of the drug war, working in the State Department's Narcotics Bureau, interviewing DEA and other agents around the world. Um, and there really was almost no reform movement to speak of at that time. Normal it had its heyday in the 70s. And by the way, uh, my podcast, Psychoactive, I think next week's episode is my interview with Keith about marijuana in the 70s. So I think you'll, you may well enjoy that. Um, but then it was 1987. I had finished my dissertation. I was about to start a teaching job at Princeton. I had met nobody in the reform movement. And I realized that, you know, two of the, and I'd been, there was a conference that it was about to be organized in London by Arnold Treback, and also I think Kevin Zeese, who had been ahead of Normal briefly, um, to create what became the Drug Policy Foundation. And I said, before I leave town, I should so meet a few of the pioneers. Well, it turned out Norman Zinberg lived two blocks down from me on Irving Street in Cambridge, and Lester Grimspoon was in town as well. And I called both of them up. I went to see Lester. And my recollection, I asked Peter to check the date on this, um, but um, is that I walked into Lester's office and I had the feeling, if my recollection is right, that as I walked in, he was talking to an editor at the New York Times about publishing an op-ed where he was first going to reveal the story about his son and the leukemia and Betsy securing the marijuana. And, um, and so we met there. And then I went to Princeton, and I'm asked to teach a course on drug policy. I invite Lester to come speak. Uh, then the Drug Policy Foundation is getting created, and Lester and I land up on the honorary, uh, the advisory board of the Drug Policy Foundation. So we're seeing one another there. And then a couple years later, I create a working group at Princeton, the Princeton Working Group on the Future of Drug Use or Alternatives to Drug Prohibition, to try to figure out what would be the optimal model of, 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 of drug policy to try to you know, minimize the harms of prohibition, uh, minimize the risks of legalization, and try to et cetera, et cetera. And I asked Lester to join. And it also included you know, Sasha Shulgin and Andy Weil and Stanton Peel and Robin Room and Harry Levine and Craig Reinerman and Marsha Rosenbaum and a whole range of Michael Aldrich, a whole range of other wonderful people. Um, meanwhile, I'm teaching. And for me, Lester's marijuana book was not the book. For me, the book was Drug Control in a Free Society by Grinspoon and Bacalar, which I saw as the outstanding book analyzing sort of historical cultural analysis, using it with public policy analysis. That was my required reading for my drug policy seminars at Princeton at that time. So I love that book. This, by the way, is the first time I'm meeting Jake Bacalar in all these years, because he never showed up at the reform events. He was just writing this great stuff with Lester. And I always wondered who this mystery character was. Um, and, then, and then I guess and we would see one another at the normal conferences and the Drug Policy Foundation conferences. And then I start the Linda Smith Center in 1994, named after Alfred Linda Smith, who was the generation before Arnold Treback and Norman Zinberg and Lester Grinspoon and such, and who had been the pioneer of challenging conventional thinking about drug policy and addiction back in the beginning of the 1930s. And we decide that one of the things we're going to do is to reprint the most requested out of print books. And the first one on our list was Psychedelic Drugs Reconsidered, which had been the true eye-opener for me about the whole kind of the first renaissance of psychedelic research back from the 50s to the late 60s, early 70s by Grinspoon and Bacalar. And, just, and it was a book, we reprinted it as a Linda Smith reprint. And it was, it sold out. We had to sell, get it out there again. I think the reason it was most requested was because so many people had stolen it from libraries. <laughs> and then we decided to launch on uh, this other venture, which was to print a new book. And the new book was going to be Marijuana Miss, Marijuana Facts by John Morgan and Lynn Zimmer. 
And this was, I think, the outstanding book on marijuana in the late 90s into the aughts and beyond, challenging all of the myths in a beautiful, I mean, you could teach, this book could be assigned in methodology courses, not just in, in stuff on marijuana. But it's in this context I'm going to tell the one embarrassing story about Lester, which is uh, this book is coming out, and it's going to be outstanding, and it sold tens and tens of thousands of copies. And, and, and Lynn Zimmer and I were very close friends. And, 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 and Lynn, um, she says, you know, he said, like, I don't know, Lester is being very cool with us. And I, I don't know what it's about. And so finally she calls Lester, right? And the book was, had just been printed. And she goes, Lester, like, is anything the matter? I mean, don't you like the book? He goes, well, no, it's a good book. It's a good book. And, 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 and she goes, but why are, you know, you just seem distant on this thing. And, and he goes, you know, Lynn, I have to tell you, I mean, I'm just hurt that you and John, I mean, I looked at the acknowledgments and I'm not even mentioned in the acknowledgments. And, and, and he goes, <coughs> Lester, you're kidding me, right? And no, no, he goes, no, I mean, my name's nowhere there. And Lynn goes, Lester, the book's dedicated to you. <laughs> and he goes, oh my, did I step in it. But it was a wonderful story. He was, I mean, Lester really was the true pioneer. And I know this is, marijuana was his, you know, the really thing. But it was that other scholarship, the psychedelics book, and the one other one with Jake, Drug Control and a Free Society. And of course, his commitment to reform, his involvement with Normal, with Drug Policy Foundation, you know, always being out there. So, and I said, the last thing too, is when I got involved, um, you know, my dad had just recently died. And, but I remember being struck that Lester, and Arnold Treback, the founder of Drug Policy Foundation, had both been born the same year as my dad, 1928. Mm -hmm. And there was this just little karmic connection mm -hmm. of coming into this field at that time. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, James, since Ethan mentioned it, I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about that sort of second wave of books after Marijuana Reconsidered made such a splash. Um, yeah, drug, drug Control, the psychedelics book. Uh, how, how was your thinking? How were the narratives evolving uh, by the time you got to those books, and what was the what was the philosophy or the uh, sort of point on the horizon that you and Lester were orienting yourself uh, towards as you embarked on those books? What was the landscape that they were well, trying to address? We were thinking about the history of drug control as it developed during the 20th century, and uh, in drug control of a free society, we began with uh, going way back. We began with uh, John Stuart Mill's uh, On Liberty, published in 1859. And in which he defends liberty. And among the liberties he de that he defended at the time was uh, the liberty of taste and pursuit. And among those, he included the use of drugs at the time, of drugs and alcohol. Uh, and in the 19th century, and it also, he also was a radical defense of free speech, which was perhaps not so common in the 19th century. But at that time, uh, his, his defense of the free use of the, the taste and pursuit of drug abuse was, was normal. It was it was, a, it was the it was it was in accordance with established policies, that changed in the 20th century for both good and ill. We have many more regulations on drugs, fewer regulations on free speech, and uh, the book the book was partly an attempt to discuss the reasons for this, why it developed, and how maybe it's starting to move back again a little bit, at least with respect to marijuana and psychedelic drugs, uh, toward a more uh, recognition vision of the. Uh, seeing these things as tastes and pursuits rather than as they developed during the reform movements of the 20th century uh, where drugs came to be regarded as well, epidemic disease because addiction was an epidemic disease or as uh, dangerous instruments because it was reckless use of something that should not be used that way or something that had to be that consumer, consumer protection because uh, uh, it was not, these were dangerous instruments that could, you, people couldn't decide to use on their own. It was something that had, they had to be protected from. And we do have a lot of consumer protection laws. A lot of these things, these things are good. And that's why, as someone mentioned, I think, I think Peter mentioned, uh, the curious thing was that uh, why is it, if, if, if drug control is a consumer protection law, why is it the people who were more familiar with the effects of these drugs, who knew more, were less likely to believe in, that, they were, uh, that they were terribly harmful? Uh, so that, that, that analogy didn't work. Fully, so you fell back on the analogy that drugs were a, uh, a threat to the most threat to the social and moral order, and uh, 
we, so we've used these analogies in turn, where one failed, you fell back on another. And now, I think now these, in some respects, these, these um, all giving reasons for prohibition and control, including criminal controls, which never worked very well, uh, of course. Uh, and it was interesting that, that drug control also originally was a reform movement, and including prohibition of alcohol. And when we did get rid of alcohol prohibition, it was not because people suddenly decided that alcohol was safe or anything like that. It was because there was persistent public sentiment uh, in favor of the pleasures of using alcohol, which led people to not to be so much concerned about e even the very serious effects of alcoholism and, uh, and drunkenness. Uh, and the same thing is happening with, with the same thing is happening to a great extent with marijuana, which in which case the the, the, the harmful effects are much less serious uh, today. So we have we've had a movement from libertarianism in the 19th century to uh, control, which was partly reform and partly mistaken uh, uh, mistaken imposition of the criminal law. And now we're moving a little bit way way back toward a more a uh, libertarian attitude toward drug use, some drugs anyway. And so as you try to dismantle uh, those narratives and, and like you said, falling back from sort of one framework to another as, as, as they sort of fall apart under uh, examination, um, I, I wonder uh, how you think like Lester, you know, and I'd open this up to anyone, you know, how did, how did Lester help dismantle those narratives and also why did it take so long right because in these in these books you know you've demolished uh, you know you've demolished these walls one after another uh, but when you look at the charts of public opinion on say the legalization of, of cannabis they lag significantly uh, behind that so I would just invite folks to maybe reflect on um, what were the forces what were the narratives that were preventing those views from becoming more widespread or more widely held I might start by saying uh, one of the sons mentioned this data earlier, but when the year normal was founded in 1970, Gallup had just done their first survey asking how many people favor marijuana legalization. They did it in 69, actually. Before that, they didn't even think the question was important enough to ask. So when we started, we had 88% of the country against us and only 12% in favor of what we were trying to do. I guess we were idealistic. Maybe we just didn't read the data. I'm not sure. <laughs> At any event, uh, when I am asked sometimes, how come in the last five, eight, ten years, you've made such enormous progress where for 30 or 40 years, man, you had to be up close with a microscope to see when we occasionally made a, a you know, we got a $100 civil fine bill passed in 73 in Oregon. Well, it, it was important. We got 11 states during the 70s. Then we didn't get anything for almost 20 years and the medical use came forward and kind of softened people up. And then in 2012, the, the legalization movement broke through in Colorado and Washington. The reason we are winning now to a great extent is because we outlived our opponents. And as strange as that may sound, people my generation were the problem, my contemporaries. They lived through reefer madness it was almost impossible to overcome the prejudice that they had built in in their education system. So, uh, as so long as they were still running things, uh, we just couldn't win. We could gain a couple of percentage points every year, but we sure as hell didn't have a majority. But as my generation began to retire and step aside and die and be replaced by younger people, they weren't freaked out. They hadn't lived through or paid attention to reefer madness. Either they smoked it or somebody in their family did or somebody in their colleagues, and they realized it was no big deal. So um, literally, the reason we're winning so much now is that most of our opponents are no longer with us. I, I actually am not quite as optimistic, uh, and perhaps because I deal with women and uh, during pregnancy and women who have uh, children. Uh, uh, we, we know that uh, the research is in that uh, marijuana consumption during pregnancy does not harm the fetus. Uh, and yet women who smoke uh, during pregnancy or use it for hyperemesis gravidarum, morning sickness, um, are now arrested. Their babies are taken away from them, uh, removed right after birth. And I, I just had a, a case a couple years ago, people call me about these and say, well, you know, would you testify for us? But a case in Michigan where 
couple having their first baby, working class couple, both of them employed. She was tested during labor and delivery, found out that she was a cannabis user, had the baby taken away while she was breastfeeding. They called me and I called the attorney general for the state and I said, I called the office and said, what's the deal in Michigan? Well, we just don't think that a household uh, with small children and with marijuana in the household is safe for small children. And I said, but wait a minute, you have guns? You know, and they're allowed, uh, dishwasher detergent is allowed, aspirin is allowed, all these things are allowed, but not cannabis. These are intelligent, educated parents. This, this is not unusual. This is going on all over the country. So I think we have a ways to go. Uh, and I, so there's work to be done. Yeah. Um, what I was going to say was, I mean, on that issue that Melanie's talking about, you know, it, it's important to be aware of actually two issues. One is there's an organization called National Advocates for Pregnant Women, founded by Lynn Paltrow, which has specifically been working on this issue with the intersection of reproductive rights and drug policy reform and taking on this issue of the criminalization of pregnant women for, for using drugs. The other one, which um, my successors had a drug policy alliance, Cassandra Federico will talk about, is Drug Policy Alliance's new project specifically engaging on issues around this, about the sorts of criminal and civil penalties that are sort of the more pernicious elements that are perpetuated, whether with marijuana or other drugs. Um, but what I wanted to say is where I would disagree with Keith is I don't think it's just generational change, because you want to ask, ask the question, you know, how and why is it that the United States, which was essentially the global driver of the war on drugs from the early 20th century until more or less 2014, when the Obama administration softened up and sort of handed off the baton of global drug war leader to the Russians. Um, you know, why, why is that same country the one which essentially became the pioneer of legalizing marijuana? And I think the pivotal role there really comes down to the strategy that we employed on medical marijuana. I think, you know, medical marijuana, you know, as Keith said, there was a moment of decriminalization in the 70s, and then there was Bob Randall nationally and Dennis Perone in California and others pursuing the medical marijuana thing in the 80s and into the early 90s. But there came a moment um, in the mid-90s um, and uh, I had recently left Princeton, started my organization, was working with Soros and beginning to you know, get involved politically. And, and a couple of things had happened. Uh, Dennis Perone with some allies had drafted, uh, he was an AIDS and marijuana activist in California, had drafted a kind of almost back of the envelope initiative, a very short initiative, very wide, open-ended. And then simultaneously, the head of the ECOU, Ira Glasser, had persuaded one of his not so major donors at the time, Peter Lewis, to fund a poll on marijuana and medical marijuana. And one of the results of that 1995 poll by the ACLU, I think Lauren Siegel, who's sitting in the audience, was involved in that as well, was that um, they found that there was reason to believe, well, first of all, not just that there were a majority of Americans who favored making marijuana legal for medical purposes with a doctor's recommendation, but that there was reason to believe that legalizing medical marijuana would help open up a broader discussion around uh, basically marijuana legalization. And so, you know, when I was in a fortuitous position because I had Soros, and Soros turned out to be interested in this issue. Then there's Peter Lewis, who was interested in marijuana. And then a fellow named George Zimmer, the founder of the Men's Warehouse, also interested in it, also for somewhat personal reasons, was able to pull them together, hire, get a campaign going, and we won that Prop 215 Medical Marijuana Initiative in 1996. And it was really the first time that the nascent drug policy reform movement showed that we could play ball in the major leagues of American politics. I mean, it created a, you know, it was front page of Newsweek magazine, and we had the, the Clinton administration top drug control officials stepping out and threatening to sue doctors and patients for, you know, recommending marijuana. But I think it really was a pivotal moment because there was a debate back then. There was a fear that by legalizing medical marijuana and essentially decriminalizing medical marijuana patients, that we peel off the most sympathetic victims of marijuana prohibition and undermine the momentum towards border legalization. The converse theory was essentially that 
this would help bring this thing out of the closet, change the face of who was the marijuana consumer from the high school drug, you know, dropout with you know hemp leaves and his blonde dreadlocks to some older person who was using it for you know to deal with the nausea of chemotherapy or multiple sclerosis or AIDS wasting syndrome and all these sorts of things. And so in the advertising for this thing, Dennis Perlman was very upset that he got pushed aside, but we had to focus the imagery on who were the victims of people using marijuana medically, on the doctors, the nurses, and the patients. And I think, in fact, that initiated a movement where a few years later, you know, we were able to go back to Alaska, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Nevada, and Maine, six states, and legalize medical marijuana in those six states between 98 and 2000. And dispensaries started popping up. And then in 2007, New Mexico, the first authorized dispensaries, bringing this whole thing above ground, changing the imagery, changing the whole thing, because people were sympathetic. You know, you could have a state legislative hearing and somebody would come in in their wheelchair with their MS and they'd light up a joint and they, instead of being arrested, they, the hard, cold-hearted Republicans would be in tears, you know, hearing these stories of this stuff. Um, and there was also one other variable, I'm just going to finish with this, that when you try to assess political change and what moves things along, I think the thing that's impossible to measure, but which turned out to be usually in our favor, is that after we won the first medical marijuana initiative in California in 96, and then that string of others and all the media attention, there was, the, there, was the, there was the news media attention. But the other thing was the entertainment media. In that period of time, almost every popular TV show, both comedies and dramas, found a way to insert medical marijuana into their story. Remember Murphy Brown? Um, you know, Susan Sarandon would never do a movie unless she was do, you know, smoking a joint one way or another. And she even did one where she used it medically, I think, Stepmom or something like that. The entertainment media really helped to normalize this thing in a very powerful way. And the result, result, I think, is that America, you know, we thought the Dutch were going to be the first or other European countries or Canada, but it was really America, Colorado and Washington, not the national level and then other states, which really landed up becoming the pioneer, notwithstanding the broader drug war ethos of the rest of the, of the, rest of the country. Thanks, Ethan. So I uh, can't believe we've moved through uh, so much time so quickly already. I, I would want to leave some time for questions because we have uh, so many great minds up here on the stage and I want to give everyone a chance to uh, interact with them. Um, but I just wanted to open it up for just one last reflection on, um, you know, you just mentioned like the, uh, the 90s uh, uh, California initiative that really kicked things off. To, to what extent, um, you know, does that bear Luster's stamp, I wonder? And to what extent, you know, does the whole contemporary legalization movement bear his stamp? And also, if you want to just add... How, how does it inform your own work as you, as you all move forward in this work or as you hand the baton off to the next generation of, of advocates? I wonder um, how Lester figures into that, how his legacy figures into that. Um, and if we could keep that brief, we'll, then we'll have time for uh, questions. Anyone who wants to jump in? Well, I, I, <clears throat> I think if Lester were here, he'd, still, he'd say we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, I, I think that I'm, I'm thinking of my own experience in in Illinois, we have a wonderful uh, cannabis law. But I argued, as that was coming up, vigorously for the ability to grow cannabis in your own backyard or on your windowsill, as we have done for thousands and thousands of years as a human society. I could not get that into the, uh, into the bill. And what will happen is that people will grow it in their yards but it will be black people who will be arrested for it. And I, I think that the social justice issues surrounding the cannabis laws are still very much in the forefront and that we have to do something about them. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the, the laws are there, but they're unequally applied. And Lester would see that right away and, and be writing about it. So. Yeah, and as, I, as his sons mentioned, uh, right, just that, that experience with anti-Semitism, uh, oh. and his, his, his life was really informative. And I, I have to imagine that he wouldn't be thrilled about the idea of, frankly, like a bunch of, uh, you know, private equity investors being the ones who, who never had any skin in the game, exactly. who never had to worry about walking Absolutely. around with an eighth in their pocket, that they Absolutely. would be the ones walking away with the profits from this industry after these, you know, the decades of this movement and all the you work bet. that folks like you and him have, have put into it. I imagine that would have made his blood... Boy, for sure. Uh, 
I, I just I guess I'd say, uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned on that point of anti-Semitism. There's a, there's a delightful exhibit in New York right now at uh, YIVO, at the Center for Jewish History, called Jews and Cannabis. And, um, and one of the people featured in it is Lester. And one of the points, I was talking to the curator, Eddie Portnoy, um, the other day, and he has this wonderful quote um, in which Nixon on the tapes is talking to uh, Haldeman, his aide Haldeman, 1971. And he's going, this damn marijuana legalization thing, it's all the Jews. What is it about the Jews? Why are they the head of it? It must be because they're all psychiatrists. <laughs> and what Eddie said is he's almost certain that was Nixon's reference to Lester. Yeah, right. so we, so, we, you know, with the Globe, we, a few years ago, we published a story, I think uh, Peter referenced this in his remarks earlier, um, I was able to call up the Nixon archive, uh, the presidential library in California, and, you know, being aware of that uh, mm -hmm. tape, and I asked, could we get a copy of any of Nixon's briefings or, like, press packet from that particular day that that, that rant was mm -hmm. recorded, and sure enough, that morning in his news clips was a UPI wire service review of marijuana considered. And Nixon uh -huh. himself, this is, I have a high quality, I've actually, I gave, before Lester passed, I was able to give him a copy of, uh, of this yeah. uh, letter that we had obtained and he really got a kick out of it. Uh, but Nixon himself had circled Grinspoon's name and he, he wrote, Halderman, I'm sure I recall, this clown is far on the left. And he underlined <laughs> far. <laughs> yeah, to just dismiss the whole, the whole I just wanted, I want to leave her. Yeah, I want to make one other point, though, which is that when I think about, you know, the future here, the issue that I find myself most drawn to these days is the fight over e-cigarettes and tobacco harm reduction. And unlike marijuana, where I have a very deep personal connection and appreciation <laughs> of plants, I hate tobacco. And my dad died of, you know, prematurely probably because of his cigarette smoking. But where the evidence overwhelmingly shows that e-cigarettes and other non-combustible forms of tobacco dramatically reduce the risk, are a true harm reduction innovation that can revolutionize and dramatically reduce the harms of tobacco and nicotine in our society. But I'm drawn to the issue in part because it reminds me of what I encountered getting involved in drug policy to reform back in the 80s, where the more you look at the science and the evidence, it more takes you this direction. But the politicians, the media, and the public are all going that direction. And it's, so to say to this audience, most of us are not friendly towards tobacco and have no reason to be friendly to tobacco. But the level of ignorance and myths around this issue of tobacco, tobacco harm reduction, and non-combustibles, I think is monumental. And I do think if you look at what just happened the last few days with Juul's e-cigarette being banned, and with the government proposing to remove the nicotine or reduce the nicotine content in cigarettes so they're no longer basically cigarettes, like reducing the, you know, saying marijuana is only allowable if THC is below 0.5 or 0.3 or alcohol during prohibition is only permissible if the alcohol is that low. I actually think that we are setting moving forward on a path where 20 or 30 years from now, marijuana will be fully legal, but we will now have tobacco being launched into the major leagues of the global drug traffic, global mass incarceration, all of the racial justice issues and racism that we see with these other sorts of things. So it's just a heads up for this group that I think even as we win this battle, there's another one looming, another demonized drug, more demonized for much more legitimate reasons, um, but we're, we're looking at as if we never learned the lessons we should. Lester was here to write a book on that. I was just thinking that. Yeah. Uh, 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 you asked how, how Lester's work would be carried forward. I think there are two aspects of court to it, of course. One is the scholarship and research, and that's very important, and I think uh, Peter has done some work on that recently. He's coming out with a book. And uh, uh, the other is public advocacy. He did both. He was unusual, I think, in doing both. And I think that that's, that's one of the things that will have to be important in the future. In particular, I think the way we conceive of the drug problem is going to have to change. Uh, as I, I've thought sometimes, the way we talk about a drug problem, it's as if we thought about the danger of drowning as the deep water problem. And it's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit of a misconception of what the problem is. Uh, and uh, because the... the We've always, people have always had a desire to alter consciousness, so there always is some risk involved in that. Like any uh, sport, there's some risk involved. Any adventure, there's some risk involved in that. Uh, it's as though you, um, you, know, say you could compare mountain climbing with getting high. Mountain, mountain climbing is a form <laughs> of getting high. It's dangerous, it's risky. No one thinks that it has to be abolished for that reason. And uh, 
Uh, I think that most of these issues are about recon reconceiving the notion of a drug problem as well as continuing the public advocacy and the kind of scholarly research that Lester was devoted to. Thanks, and, and I, I really appreciate that personally too because um, that's something I've tried to do in my own work is to marry, on one hand, a clear-eyed uh, you know, vision of the actual harms um, and the, the uh, unacceptability of the status quo, but then at the same time staying grounded in fact, staying grounded in, in research and, and objective truth. And I, I appreciate that even as Lester felt so strongly about this, he never went over the, uh, over the waterfall, if I can say that, of just uh, sort of mindless rah-rah, you know, we 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 cares everything. I think I, he stay, he stayed grounded in that um, that scientific pursuit of of truth, um, and just was taking away our stigma uh, and our misconceptions about it, which felt very political because those stigmas and misconceptions were so uh, deep. Um, and I, I think about that a lot, and I appreciate you calling that out, Keith. I I think if Lester were with us today. <laughs> what he would probably be most excited about, and certainly it's what I feel most excited about right now, is a particular provision in the new New York legalization law. As all of this room knows, in the states, 19, I guess now in the District of Columbia, that have legalized marijuana, generally, you can only smoke it in a private home. Well, we don't want to be limited our, the rest of our lives to only socializing in our home or someone else's home. And one of the problems is, if you're white and middle class, you probably have private place to smoke. But exactly. if you're a color, if you're a brown skin right. or black skin, if you're low income, you, li you live in the kind of housing where you cannot smoke tobacco or marijuana, and you can't smoke it walking around, you, you may do it, but you're taking a risk if you smoke it walking around the street, and that's why so many people are arrested for that. New York recognized that, and right now, any place where it's legal to smoke tobacco in New York, you can smoke marijuana, and that means walking down the street in a neighborhood. I think Lester would be thrilled with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, right here, right here yeah. in Massachusetts, um, Right here in Massachusetts, we have a bill pending right now that would uh, finally implement the social consumption provision of our legalization law here, which uh, essentially because of a technical flaw yeah. has yet to be implemented. Uh, and so if this bill passes this summer, uh, municipalities would finally be able to opt into that. And, uh, you know, a lot of proponents have pointed out, uh, as you alluded to, renters, uh, you know, public uh, housing tenants, or even tourists, not that they're at the top of my list of people I'm concerned about, but it's a little absurd to, you know, you come to Massachusetts, Cannabis is legal. You can go to a store and buy it, but you can't use it in your hotel room. You can't use it on the sidewalk. I guess we can just take the joint out and look at it. Um, <laughs> Dan, I should just I, say that, you know, I just to acknowledge that the, probably the, the individual most responsible for that reform is Cassandra Federique, who will be on the stage shortly. So, yeah. Um, we have some real luminaries coming up. We just have a couple uh, moments left. I'm sorry that uh, our conversation ran so long here. Again, I'm sure we could probably stay up here for five hours and not run out of things to talk about. Did anyone want to uh, ask a quick question before we've uh, got to go? Sure, in the back. That's a good question, and we and we have seen, uh, for folks who don't know, a, a handful of municipalities in Massachusetts have sort of unilaterally decriminalized uh, psychedelics. I think, including Somerville and um, a few other communities. But did, did anyone want to weigh in on that? Well, I guess I could just say, you know, a lot of this comes down to where the most effective taxes and strategies with respect to cannabis. The feds were basically the problem, but almost all of the money, resources, activism went at the local level. And taking advantage of the ballot initiative process and the opportunities for state legislatures to follow, remember, both with medical marijuana and with marijuana legalization, it began first with some local initiatives, then with a half a dozen or more state ballot initiatives succeeding, and then the state legislatures, you know, following suit, because typically the 
politicians were behind the public on this sort of stuff. In the psychedelics area, it's different because you, know, you had a strategy advanced initially by MAPS, uh, Mel M Rick Doblin's Multidisciplinary Associated Psychedelic Studies, about getting the FDA approval. And you know, you know, they pursued, they saw that this was an incredibly valuable avenue, first with MDMA and now to some extent with psilocybin, but at the same time, there is this parallel track, right, of the local initiatives and now the Oregon initiative, um, but, you know, which are much more, you know, somewhat similar to the marijuana reform initiatives in the sense of at least decriminalizing uh, personal possession. A little bit different because medical marijuana aimed to decriminalize and then put in regulation, whereas in this area you have the medical track of psychedelics looking for regulation. On the other hand, the decrim nature and other local activist tracks that are kind of want to minimize regulation and emphasize the personal right to use these substances and not be prohibited or regulated by the government. But I think it's really a matter of calculation about where the resources are, are, are best devoted. Anyone else want to sneak in one more question? Single. Oh, yeah, we're not going to talk about it either, Dick. <laughs> the single convention on narcotics drugs. You know, um, I mean, I think, you know, there's been a, there was a debate for now many years about what should one do with the 1961 single convention on narcotic drugs, which is basically the, the main um, legal document underlying modern uh, uh, global drug prohibition, right? There, there were other ones as well, but that's the pivotal one. And I remember I was, you know, part of discussions in the, you know, you know, last 10, 5, 10 years, and especially with the United Nations General, General Assembly Special Session on Drugs in 2016, about which we should you do. And it ranged really, there were like, you know, everybody from saying we should abolish this and replace it with something else, maybe modeled on the WHO Tobacco Control Convention, to those saying let's make an exception for cannabis or make an exception for coca or let's do what the Bolivian President Evo Morales did, which is to withdraw from the treaty and then to rejoin but make an exception in their case for coca. Um, uh, so, you know, or to try to pursue modifications. But I think, you know, one of the most effective strategies has been to some extent to ignore it. So when, you know, President uh, Jorge Mojica in Uruguay, you know, played the leadership role in Uruguay becoming the first country to legalize cannabis, right, you know, the year after Colorado and Washington legalized. And when he received a letter from the International Narcotics Control Board, the INCB, the official UN watchdog and protector and guardian of the conventions, my understanding is when he got that letter from the INCB, he just tossed it in the garbage. Um, and, you know, when Canada moved forward, you know, their lawyers looked at it, but ultimately these trees are not binding in a way. And so, although there's an issue in that the less developed countries tend to kind of, you know, owe the single convention, the single convention, the more developed, you know, the countries in Europe and elsewhere, maybe Canada, they basically look at the single convention and the International Narcotics Control Board and they say, well, you got your lawyers and we got ours. And whether the issue is medical marijuana, legalization of can uh, cannabis, needle exchange, heroin prescribing, safe injection sites, et cetera, you know, we believe that, in fact, the single convention can accommodate these sorts of reforms up to a very good extent. So, you know, fortunately, national governments have found their ways around this. Uh, the U.S., you know, I think one reason the Obama administration took so long to figure out what to do with uh, Colorado and Washington was their concerns. But ultimately, I think, we're going to move forward irrespective of the single convention. Thanks, Thanks for that question, Dick. I'm, I'm personally fascinated to see how things play out internationally. One thing I'm really interested in is, uh, you know, hearing more and more about, like, you know, larger corporate cannabis operators that have been uh, working in the legal markets, like in the U.S. and Canada, now getting these sort of permits in developing nations to grow cannabis there, often while it is still criminalized for the uh, actual, you know, residents of that country, which leads to this sort of image of right of, like, the plantation almost surrounded by razor wire where you're allowed to grow cannabis, but you know, the folks living in the village outside the plantation are, are still being thrown in jail for it, which just seems very perverse to me. So maybe our, maybe our uh, Where We're Going panel will, will dive into some of that. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, feel free, I'm volunteering our panelists to be ambushed by you if you have any more questions as they mill around. Uh, and I just want to, again, thank UMass and thank all of you for, uh, for your attention. Thanks so much.